Welcome to the fifth case of uh, exam preparation courses in anesthesia. Uh, this case will be discussing a case of aortic stenosis undergoing colonic surgery. Uh, so that's our patient. He's a 75 year old male patient with a history of diabetes, hypertension, and aortic stenosis coming for right hemiplectomy as he has a cancer colon. Uh, this patient is on glipizide, uh, prenopril, and hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, his hemoglobin is showing 8.7, and platelet count is 170, and creatine is 132. So, how we are going to the approach this patient? This is our discussion today. Uh, we have some questions in this patient, and I will mention the questions, then we'll go in details of each question. How we are going to assess this patient preoperatively? What are your echo values of this patient of consideration? Which surgery will do first if he has an aortic stenosis? Is it the aortic surgery first or cancer colon first? Uh, what are the causes and implications of anemia in this patient? And why he is on ACE inhibitors? What is the mechanism of action? And what are the main side effects of ACE inhibitors? Why is this patient on glipizide? And again, what is the mechanism of action of this drug? And how we are going to uh, anesthetize this patient? And as per request of many of my colleagues, they are asking me to give uh, some hints or some lectures on physiology. So whenever there will be an implication from physiological point of view, we'll discuss. So we are going to discuss the pressure volume uh, loops in the uh, aortic stenosis. So now let's go to our scenario. Uh, this patient, how we are going to approach him in the preoperative assessment. This patient has two main axes, uh, if you're thinking about him. Uh, the first axis is he is a general patient. He is going for general surgery. So he's a diabetic, hypertensive, it could be ischemic heart disease. He has uh, renal impairment and he has anemia. Uh, and he's a cancer patient, maybe post uh, radio or chemotherapy. And the other axis, he's a cardiac patient going for non cardiac surgery. He has an aortic stenosis that needs an assessment. What's the assessment of aortic stenosis? History, examination, investigations, history, examination, investigations, and consultations. So, in the history, what you are thinking for in aortic stenosis, three manifestations are important in this patient. What are those manifestations? First is shortness of breathing angina or chest pain and syncopal attacks. So short of breathing, angina or chest pain and syncope in his history. Examination. How we are going to assess a patient with aortic stenosis? Now, general manifestations like pulse and its characteristics in aortic stenosis and the murmur and how we prescribe that. So to prescribe any murmur, number one, the grade of murmur is one to six. The site of the murmur in, in aortic stenosis it's mainly on the aortic area on the second right intercostal space and uh, the propagation it does not propagate to the apex it's a systolic murmur and it's harsh uh, mid systolic murmur so harsh mid systolic murmur in the aortic area with grade 1 to 6 and we know that any grade less than 4 should be auscultated by a stethoscope now this is the grading of the murmur. Now, how are you going to investigate this patient? Please, again, if you mention any uh, investigation, you have to put its rationale. That's very important. What are the investigations you are going to request for this patient? Full blood count, renal profile, ECG, and echocardiography. So, full blood count, it's showing anemia, and it could be justified by what? We'll discuss that in the next question. Uh, and uh, renal impairment could be justified by his ACE inhibitors and hypertension, aortic stenosis with low flow, any of these can cause his renal impairment plus the regular causes of renal impairment, pre-renal, renal and post-renal. ECG showing manifestation of the left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, echocardiography in this patient is very important and essential as it is the gold standard in any valvular heart disease. The same as coronary angiography is the gold standard for any patient with ischemic heart disease. Keep that in your mind. What you're searching for in the echo, uh, you are going to check the valve and diameter because that how you characterize your aortic stenosis grade and then left ventricular wall thickness, left ventricular uh, hypertrophy uh, and cardiac output or ejection fraction. So these uh, criteria, normal, mild, moderate and severe. As per the table in front of you here, the normal valve area is 3 to 4 and gradient less than 5 and velocity is less than 2 meters per second. Mild aortic stenosis 
if his valve area more than 1.5 up to 3 and gradient less than 25 and jet velocity is less than 3 meters per second. Moderate aortic stenosis if his valve area 1 to 1.5 and gradient 25 to 40 millimeter mercury and jet velocity is 3 to 4 meters per second. Severe aortic stenosis less than 1, less than 1 uh, centimeter square and mean gradient more than 40 and uh, jet velocity more than 4 meters per second. So this patient, the examiner is telling you that he has a diameter of 0.6 uh, and his flow across a valve causing a gradient of 25 to 40. So in this patient he has a gradient of uh, 30 and he has a valve area of 0.6. So now the question from the examiner which one you will follow? The gradient or the area? Why is there a discrepancy between both of them? That's a very important point to know in your assessment of a patient with uh, any stenotic valve lesions. In this patient, I will follow the diameter because it's more accurate. But why gradient across the valve is not following that? That means a failing heart. As you see in, here in this figure, the flow and uh, pressure gradient are correlating. Pressure gradient correlates with systemic vascular resistance multiplied by the flow across the valve. So if the flow, which is cardiac output, is decreasing in a case of failing heart lift ventricular failure, that will decrease the flow across the valve and will have an impairment of the pressure gradient. So what's more accurate here is the diameter. You have to know that very well. And that's really a strong point in the exam if you know that. And the next question here will be, will you proceed for his cancer surgery? or you will go for an aortic surgery first and that's really a challenging question you have to think about it first before you answer this one and weigh your cost and benefit in each one of them so if you are going for a cancer surgery first this is a high risk patient with a high mortality even on table mortality because he has severe aortic stenosis and uh, if you are going for aortic surgery first you will need a long term anticoagulation for this patient uh, because of aortic surgery, you will need a bypass surgery and heparinization, and this may increase his bleeding and will, be, will need massive transfusions and that, that's on its own complication. So how you are going to decide, you are not the one to decide, you need a multidisciplinary team approach for this patient. You have to sit with the cardiologist, oncologist and oncology surgeon plus uh, anesthetist and discussing cost benefit for each one of them and discuss that with the patient. So the right decision, go for balloon valvuloplasty first as a bridging therapy till you get his cancer surgery operated and cured, then go for definitive aortic valve replacement surgery. Okay, now the next question will be how this patient developed anemia. There could be many underlying causes of this patient and if you need to discover more about anemia, go back to my video about anemia. Uh, there is one detailed discussion there. Uh, so anemia here could be a chronic blood loss uh, as he has a cancer and this is a bleeding uh, cancer that could be anemia due to uh, chronic blood loss uh, he has a stenotic uh, valve lesion that could distract his uh, red cells that, that are the main uh, causes of anemia in this patient what are the implications I need to hear from you that it's, it's DO2 oxygen delivery is cardiac output multiplied by 1.39, multiplied by oxygen saturation, multiplied by his hemoglobin percent. So two main factors here affects his uh, oxygen delivery to his myocardial cells, which are cardiac output, which is already limited by aortic stenosis, and anemia, which I can improve. So this is uh, an oxygen demand supply uh, mismatch scenario. What is the mismatch here? Decreased oxygen uh, supply. Is there any problem with the demand? Yes, the problem with the demand because increasing muscle uh, mass of his left ventricle as it's pushing against high systemic vascular resistance. So I need you to write the equation here of uh, oxygen delivery and that may precipitate a type 2 myocardial infarction. He may ask you what is a type 2 myocardial infarction. Type 2 myocardial infarction is uh, a case of myocardial ischemia and infarction not caused by a thromatosplake closing coronary arteries. So it does not need uh, coronary reperfusion, it doesn't require stinting or no benefit from that. The next question will be, why is this patient on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors? That is due to his hypertension. 
and let's mention here that this is not the right treatment above 55 years old according to WHO recommendations he should be on calcium channel blockers or diuretics as one of them first then you can add the other one if the patient is less than 55 years he should be on ACE inhibitors then there's few exceptions for that like black creases should be started immediately on calcium channel or diuretics even if below 55 years old what is the mechanism of action of his ACE inhibitors as you know, uh, angiotensin uh, 1 changes to angiotensin 2 by uh, angiotensin converting enzymes. Angiotensin 2 has two mechanisms of actions. Number one, it increases systemic vascular resistance. And number two, it causes salt and water retention through its work on aldosterone system. If you block angiotensin converting enzyme, so you are decreasing angiotensin 2, so you are decreasing his systemic vascular resistance and decreasing salt and water retention through decreasing his aldosterone. That's the mechanism of action of ACE inhibitors. What are the side effects of ACE inhibitors? As you know, when you block angiotensin converting enzyme, you are decreasing angiotensin 2, but you are increasing his angiotensin 1, which goes and, and his bradykinin causes cough. And uh, that's the main side effect. Again, another side effect is the hyperkalemia as it causes uh, aldosterone depletion or decreasing in aldosterone, which causes salt water retention and potassium loss. If you block the aldosterone, so he will lose sodium and water and accumulate his potassium. Now, the next question will be the glipizide. What is the mechanism of action of glipizide? It has three mechanisms of action. Number one, it increases uh, sensitivity of cells to uh, insulin. Number two, decreases the gluconeogenesis. Number three, it increases the insulin secretion. So three mechanisms of action for glipizide. What is the main adverse effects of this one? Jaundice, hepatitis, and liver cell failure are the main side effects, despite they are rare. Okay, so now, how we are going to give anesthesia for this patient? Now consider we are going to anesthetize patient who is an aortic stenosis for any surgery. What will be your consideration? Number one, volume status, you should be euvolemic during perioperative period, heart rate should be maintained normal, 60 to 80 heart rate, uh, his inotropic state should be maintained in normal, so you can add some inotropic support for this patient to increase his contractility, as we said, low flow and decreasing in pressure gradient may impair his uh, oxygen demand supply uh, balance. Uh, and last one, systemic vascular resistance. Maintain his systemic vascular resistance within normal to high. Don't lower his systemic vascular resistance as both extremes are affecting his demand supply match. The very high systemic vascular resistance causes workload on the left ventricle and more oxygen demand. And very low systemic vascular resistance causes supply uh, problem. So keep systemic vascular resistance normal to little elevated uh, in this patient. So prepare your medications, prepare the monitors, and uh, this patient uh, post analgesia should be through an epidural versus PCA morphine, and you should discuss uh, the blood transfusion with the patient as it is a major surgery that may require blood transfusion, and you need his hemoglobin above 10 or target of uh, 10 uh, gram per deciliter. Uh, will you do a cell salvage for this patient? This is a tumor patient, or oncology patient, so cell, cell salvages are not an option here because of tumor cell. Now going to the last point of our discussion uh, in the pressure volume curves in physiology. As you see this ABCD diagram in front of you, AB line is diastolic filling phase, A is the mitral valve open, and B is the mitral valve closure, CD systolic evacuation so aortic valve opens in C and D in aortic valve is aortic valve closure so BC is in is isovolumetric contraction phase and DA is isovolumetric relaxation phase one is end systolic volume two is the end diastolic volume systolic volume is 70 mils and in diastolic volume is 150 mils so then after that B to C is isovolumetric contraction phase so there's no change in the volume just changes in the pressure so pressure is increasing from 3 to 4 this is isovolumetric contraction phase then from C to D this is the ventricular contraction 
emptying the left ventricle so the volume again decreases from 150 mils to 70 mils at the end of this phase there is isovolumetric relaxation phase from D to A so any change in the volume and failing heart will be from A to B increase so it will be right shift of this curve and any change in the pressure will be on the uh, in the y axis in from from d to d prime as you see here so i'm expecting in aortic stenosis c and c prime and d prime with elevation of the pressures from d to d prime and from c to c prime so in aortic stenosis what happens what's the physiology of aortic stenosis so narrowing of the aortic valve, uh, left ventricle exert more contraction to keep the normal cardiac output. So the left ventricular size increases gradually, causing left ventricular hypertrophy and causing increase in left ventricular pressure. So the gradient across the valve increases. With time, left ventricle fails and normalization uh, means here decrease in the gradient in a failing heart. I wish you got some benefits from this video and at the end of this video I'd like to thank you all for watching and I'm asking you to uh, subscribe to my channel and follow my videos and please put your comments and questions here I will be in touch with you soon for another video. Thank you.